Hey guys, Stuart Tomlinson, Warrior Collective. I hope you're well. Uh, back once again, Inside Chat. Now, today's guest I'm really excited to have on. It's Rick Young. Now, if you've been following martial arts uh, anywhere in the world, but especially in the UK, you will no doubt have come across uh, Rick's name. Uh, and not just in one particular martial art either. Uh, Rick's one of the few people I know that is elite level across a multitude of styles uh, and disciplines and systems. And uh, and I'm going to really kind of uh, go in a bit deeper with that to, with him today. Uh, Rick, it's great to have you on. How are you? I'm very well, thank you. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Now no, we've got our technical issues sorted and, uh, <laughs> and everything's good, you know, on, on, on my part. But I'm in my house now, so uh, yeah, everything's good. Yeah, everything's great. Thank you. Yeah, we, we tried to do uh, our first podcast a couple of days ago and technical issues uh, were, were not our friends. So it's good to finally have them resolved. Uh, the, the internet gods are smiling on us today. <laughs> Hopefully next hour or so, yeah. For sure. yeah. So Rick, um, like I just mentioned in uh, then, uh, you're not pigeonholed into one particular style, one particular background. And, uh, and actually you've been in the martial arts uh, community for a long, long time. Um, just to give people who may not know too much about it a little bit of a an idea. When did you when did you first find martial arts? The first time that I was really aware was the because I'm old enough to remember when the Bruce Lee movies came out. I couldn't actually go to them, you know. Um, but I remember seeing the posters for End of the Dragon and and. Uh, Again, you know, when when you go back that far, you know, pre-internet, pre, you know, you know, uh, um, being able to just switch something on and get like uh, Bruce Lee on TV or whatever to see the the, the picture of him with the nin nunchucks, you know, from End of the Dragon, and then the people around him, it was just unbelievable. I remember seeing it and going, "Wow, that's amazing," you know. Um, and then a friend of mine had a book by Bruce Techner, which was a, a self-defense book. And Bruce Tegner was one of the first people in America who was cross training and he taught a lot of people in Hollywood and stuff. And the funny thing about Bruce Tegner was he was somebody that I'd, I'd read about since the beginning. And about 10 years ago, I was talking to Guru Dan, Dan in the Sano, and I mentioned Bruce Tegner and he said, Rick, do you know that my black belt under him? And I went, you're joking. You're a black belt under Bruce Tegner. I said, yeah, I trained with him for two years. And I went, man, I can't believe that, honestly, because that was the first book that I ever wrote and the, yeah, that I ever read. And that was my first introduction. My friend had that, that book, and then we would do techniques out of the book. So he had like, it was like if you shake hands with someone, how to wrist lock them off a handshake. Why he would want to do that, I have no idea. But things like that, how to block a punch and do a, an ogoshi. So really simple things. And that really got me into just wanting to do martial arts. And a friend of mine, Sean Shanley, um, had been training in a place called the Edinburgh Club. The Edinburgh Club is, um, uh, we were talking about places off air there, just about in places in Edinburgh. The Edinburgh Club was the first full-time dojo in, uh, after after the Budokwai, actually, in, in Britain. Um, it was like a, a really huge uh, uh, accomplishment for George Kerr to, to actually open it up. So you had George Kerr teaching judo there. Um, you had a guy called Morris. George Kerr is now a 10th degree uh, red belt in judo. Um, Morris Allen, who is living in Virginia now, he was, he's, I think, a 7th or 8th degree in judo. One of the best, and he's a black belt in jiu-jitsu now too, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. And uh, Jimmy Delaney, who was teaching a lot of the throwing. So my friend Sean Shanley was training with them like three, four times a week. And all of these guys were animals. I mean, at their peak, I mean, really... George had just come back from Japan. He was one of the first people to train in Japan. And he was like um, a link between, one of the links between Britain and Japan. You had Morris Allen, who uh, Morris was, uh, uh, went, went to, this is how good he was. He went to Russia in 1975 
and won the World Sambo Championships. Um, called Sambo now, it was called Sambo then. The World Sambo Championships, he beat a 22 stone Russian, he was 13 stone. And uh, an absolute, and he that was only his second Sambo tournament. He'd, he'd gone to the Europeans, he got a silver there and got beat by a Russian judo uh, gold medalist. So that's a level that, uh, um, uh, that he was playing, uh, 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 working at. And he's an amazing groundwork player, amazing. And by all accounts, a lot of guys would come up, he'd tie them up in knots. So for them, for uh, Morris was just a beast. And then we had uh, Jimmy Delaney, who was uh, uh, more throwing. He didn't like groundwork. His, his, when I asked him about groundwork, he said, son, he said, my idea of groundwork is he goes, you throw them, you pick them back up, and you throw them again. And I went, oh, okay. So he didn't really go for groundwork too much. So Sean was training with all these guys. And again, we were just talking about mentality. Um, and all of these guys had a very, very hard training. Aggre- when I say aggressive, I mean, more assertive mentality. You know, if you're going to do it, do it. Jimmy had a, had a real um, background in the street, if you like. You know, he had been in a lot of street fights and was an absolute terror in the streets. Morris was a beast, and George Kerr at that time was an absolute beast. So Sean, when I met Sean, Sean was training with these guys, and even though Sean was only a year older than me, he was 14, but he was filtering through osmosis almost this kind of energy and, and, and the ethos of training really hard, you know, training super hard um, to be an absolute animal. And the aim for us in the beginning, but, but the way Sean was teaching me, because he was also doing karate at the time, a little bit of karate, um, and boxing and um, so when I started to train with Sean for us cross training was just the thing and um, I don't I can't even remember if we really called it Jeet Kune Do but really cross training and being able to fight and every range was there from the beginning it was like if you couldn't punch what's the point you know you, you can't keep the guy out what, what if you can't grapple see you go to the ground what are you going to do there and then we, we would talk, I mean, remember, this is 13 or 14 year old kids talking about knocking people out three at a time, you know, how you would hit one and move to the other. It was it was pretty primitive in terms of the, te- the technical aspect, but even though it was primitive, uh, on, on a lot of occasions it actually worked, you know, and um, so Sean influenced me in a lot of ways um, in terms of the technical aspect from the judo, really getting that, um, that emphasis on being physically strong, physically adept, physically hard training, you know, getting down, doing 100 push-ups. You couldn't do 100, do, do 90 till you fell, you dropped, and then do another 10 or do another 15. And he always had that kind of thing about pushing yourself, which is, again, was filtering through from the, the, the guys I mentioned. Um, and his aim was always not so much about style, but was to be the best street fighter that you could be because not that I came from, I'm not going to exaggerate and say I came from an incredibly tough place and whatever, but you know, it was, it was a pretty tough place. You could get in fights and stuff and you want to be able to protect yourself. And that was why I got into martial arts really. I wanted to be able to protect myself, to be able to be a fighter and to be the best fighter that I could be so that if anybody came at me, even if they won, a, won the fight, which was at that time unacceptable in my head, even if they won, they would walk away seriously injured, you know? So that was kind of the mentality that I was brought into. And then in um, uh, 1976, I, I started training with Hamish Adam, who was at that time, um, and still is, a world-class judo, uh, sorry, karate instructor in Wadoru. And Hamish had been in the 1975 World Championships in Long Beach. Um, I think he had 16 fights in a couple of days. And he got third in the world at a time when it was all styles. It was all styles there. And karate was actually super tough. So he came back and he's a world-class karate uh, instructor and player, uh, part, uh, karateka. So he he really influ- influenced me as well because, I mean, he, I mean, I was a kid and Hamish is like like a god to me, you know. And when I got to spar him, it was like just the highlight of my, my entire week, you know, if not month, you know. So, so Hamish really had a big influence on me. So I did karate for six years. I stayed with Hamish. Um, for a long time and then I kind of felt pulled away from it. Uh, I met Dan in Asanto in 1979, um, September uh, 1979 and um, he, when I saw Guru Dan, it just switched. Everything switched. He was doing everything that Sean and I had done 
in such a high level and such an incredible level that I felt, man, I need to, I need to, uh, you know, I, you know, I need to somehow connect with this guy. And remember, I'm a, I'm a 16 or 17 year old kid from Leith. I got no money. I got a job. I work in a, in a, a, a warehouse or I deliver furniture. Um, and then I'm meeting a guy who's just my hero. In fact, I, th I think I mentioned this in an interview before that when I first met Dan and Hassan, it was actually at a Bruce Lee convention and they were showing Game of Death on the big screen. So they're showing Game of Death. And at the scene where Bruce Lee is fighting Dan and Hassan, Dan and Hassan came out to watch it on the screen. So I thought, this is my chance to meet him. So I turn around, I, I, I walk out, I stand beside him, and I remember I had a cup of coffee in his hand, and I said, oh, Mr. Insan, oh, he said, yeah. And just as we were talking, Bruce Lee was killing Guru Dan on the screen. So it was like a surreal moment, you know? So me and him are watching him being killed by Bruce Lee on the screen. And, and, he, and it was just like one of those moments where I went, just, this is, a, I could finish it then and go home. But I spoke to him later and I said, I want to come and train with you. And he said to me, um, he said, yeah, yeah, whatever, kid. And I went, no, I actually was rude. I took his arm. I said, no, I said, I really want to come and train with you. I said, I'm not, I'm not kidding. And he went, yeah, okay. So that was 79. I never actually got to train with him until um, 1980. He came to Birmingham. He came to Manchester too. Um, and went to Manchester and in Birmingham. Uh, and I trained a seminar with him then, which just totally blew my mind. I mean, like, it was like just on a different, I'd never seen anything like it, you know, with the weapons, the Cali, you know, so forth, the trap and everything. So it blew my mind. And then um, I trained with them. Uh, various things happened, it's a long story, but I, I went to America in 84. Bob Breen had actually invited him over in 84. So he'd done a seminar in April 84 in London, which I went to, and which was a pivotal moment for British martial arts, I think, because there's so many different martial artists there. Um, and they were all super influenced by this seminar. So it kind of a lot of people went off, like Dave Carnell, Terry Barnett, obviously Bob Breen, you know, myself, um, uh, Nino Bernardo, uh, uh, I forget who else was there. Uh, there's quite a few people who were really influenced by that seminar. So I went to see Guru Dan four months later. I saved up, went to see him, spent seven weeks in LA, um, and um, tried to get to know him. I wanted to become a student, you know, so that was the, the aim for me. So that was kind of like the beginning from 75 up, starting with Sean, going to Hamish Adam, um, actually starting with Bruce Tegner <laughs> and uh, going, going to Sean, Hamish Adam, meeting Guru Dan, and then going from there. But in between that, I did boxing. I went to the Thick Boxing Club. So I was training in boxing uh, there, maybe two nights a week, something like that. Um, the wrestling isn't so strong in Scotland, but I did try some wrestling at Meadowbank. Um, they had some some stuff going on there. Um, but Sean was already showing me some groundwork, so I was feeling I was getting getting that covered. But uh, yeah, I was doing the boxing, doing the wrestling as well. So we're trying to put, trying to put everything together. But as I said, the, the aim at that time for me was martial arts were pretty much purely for self-defense, were purely for me to be an animal in the street. If anybody, anything kicked off, I'd be able to handle myself, which was fueled by a lot of insecurity, if I'm being honest, but um, just to be a total animal and 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 to be um, as fit, healthy as, as um, you know, as, as I could be. And so I was ready for whatever was, was going to come. Yeah, it's, it's funny how um, everyone who gets into martial arts has a different starting point, and that starting point is very depend on where they grew up uh what you know what year they were born you know like you said for, for myself as well born before the internet it's going to be a completely different experience nowadays for someone starting martial arts and it would be you know for you and you know the difference between you and me so it's it's really interesting because actually you know if you were to look at you know cliches and stereotypes you would have never imagined yourself having grown up where you grew up and you know what you started training uh, to have found a passion for um, the styles that you've learned from Dan and Asanto. Um, so, obviously, cross training has been a big part of um, your kind of thing since you since you got going. And I've I've known that about you. Like I said, over the years when I've been uh, reading 
articles and speaking to people who know you. What then is the, because obviously nowadays we've got mixed martial arts, haven't we? And that's kind of blended. It's kind of blurred the lines a little bit, hasn't it? And, and this is one of the interesting things I think is, you know, nowadays you don't see um, as many people talking specifically about different styles as they do about obviously the the combination of training ranges in mixed martial arts. So yeah. what what do you feel then is to be gained from um, the the that the approach that you've done to nowadays? Because obviously you've carried on training. You, obviously you moved from these traditional art forms and you, you've gone into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu as well, as I know, which we'll, we'll speak about shortly. But that kind of journey then, how do you see the the difference between how it was in terms of these styles are very separate to to now the more modern viewpoint of of mi the coin terms mixed martial arts i think i i think i mean i know you'll know this but i think mixed martial arts have been around for thousands of years really if we go back to pancreation ancient greece they were using weapons they were uh, striking, they were grappling. I don't know how sophisticated it was, to be honest, but they were going back, going back there. So because they were based in a in, in a in, in, uh, in, in a society that had a lot of wars, you know, and had people attacking them, you you figure out either through your friend dies because they got I don't know whatever happens to them, then you go well I need a defense for that. So um, they needed to incorporate and they needed to have something that was going to cover as many bases as possible for them. Which, as I said, because something like pancreation, you're going right back, uh, uh, you know, to ancient Greece, you know. Then even if you come a little bit further, and if you go to the, the Philippines, the Philippines, you know, is more weapon-based um, um, uh, because you needed, you needed to be able to, defend yourself against multiple attackers, which is very difficult if, you know, you're going empty hand, you know, you can maybe, maybe deal one, two, okay, let's see, you can deal three in a good day. But once you get swarmed, it's really difficult to start dealing with people like that. So the weaponry was really involved there and, and it's something like the Filipino martial arts, um, because there's 12 categories in it and, and the, the, um, uh, and the, the ancient Cali, okay, if you like. And people kind of debate this. Everybody watches and they're doing Filipino martial arts. I won't argue with them, but and in, in the Cali that I'm taught uh, by Dan Inasano coming down from uh, Florida Vila Brio, there's 12 categories which are like, which can be uh, double stick, single stick, stick and dagger, dagger and dagger, dagger, empty hand, which is the Filipino boxing, the Panatukan, uh, the Dumog, which is the Filipino grappling. Then you have uh, the the Sikaran, which is the kicking, Pan and Jackman, which is the um, the, the the boxing and, and the, the the kicking, and the Dumog together. So that's kind of putting it together. Your flexible weapons, your projectile weapons, your weapons like the yo-yo, the yo-yo that we use. You know, like the yo-yo is actually a Filipino martial art weapon. It was an English guy went to the Philippines, saw them use it as a weapon. Because he put a stone and a piece of string, hit each hit the guy, but then he'd come back, use that, and then produce that as a a a, 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 a toy here. Um, and so the Filipino martial arts have really been covering those lines for a long time. And then you go up further forward, you got like James Fig, you know, uh, and uh, and English boxing. You know, we wrote the first one of the first books on English boxing, and he says, I mean, in his book, he's got. Um, uh, the cudgel. So he's talking about obviously the, the 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 boxing, the empty hand boxing. But he's also talking about the use of the cudgel, the the stick, and then he's got the and he's got the grappling too. So you see him doing some kind of basic locks. And again, how developed they were in that. How I mean, compared to now, what we've got now, as you say, everything's like that. If you want to see anybody at the best level, you know, Sian so Chai, whoever, you know, then you're going to be able to just switch on YouTube and get it right away. But how so? How good those guys were, I don't know. But the concept was definitely in the head. That uh, there's something like Fig. We knew, although he's primarily boxing, that sometimes you need to use a weapon, and sometimes you would need to use, um, you know, grappling too if the, the hands didn't work. So, kind of going forward to now, um, I think as you say, is I mean, you could talk for about for hours. But the difference in learnings is is totally different. Before 
from a URI, you would have to go to someone. So you'd go to, um, oh, let, let me give an example. Manchester, right? Toddy. I used to go down and see Toddy on his weekend courses, Master Toddy, okay? So I'd go down on his weekend courses, get some things, and then go back up to Edinburgh, practice some with my friend Steve Stevenson, and then come back and go, no, 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 you've got to do this, you've got to do that. And then he would have one weekend he'd be working on elbow, one weekend would be knee, one weekend would be teep, one weekend would be round kick, you know, one weekend would be defense. So then you would have to take it. You you couldn't um, then go back to the internet and check it out and double check it. So it was a different learning process. And the pr learning process was a lot, I think, a lot longer. And, and uh, you, you, I, well, I didn't have access to it because I wasn't from Manchester. So that was, um, you know, kind of back then. Now people have access to so much, I think, not everybody, but some people will get kind of, kind of lost in it because they want to do, you know, it's kind of like a kid that wants to have their, their dessert before their main meal, you know. They go, oh, no, I want to do that because I saw so-and-so do that. You're going, but in order to get to that level, you have to be able to do this first. No, no, I want to do that. And you go, okay, then fine. If you want to do that, it's fine. Whereas before, most of the time, you would take what your instructor said on face value, which was good and bad in some ways, you know. Um, uh, for me, I've always been pretty lucky with my instructors. I've always been honest with me. So I think now the difference is that the information is so much more accessible. It's ridiculously accessible. But um, the problem, again, is that people... It's like we live in a nanosecond culture, a culture where people, it's a throwaway culture. So people will come to you to learn, let's say, Muay Thai, and then they go, yeah, I'm going to try somebody else now because I didn't like that. I'm going to do, and you're going, because they'll show me faster. And and, and you have to have trust, you know, in, 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 in a student-teacher uh, student relationship. So in, in regards to people now, I think the information is there for them, which is fantastic. I, I, I've said before, I think we're living in the best time ever for learning martial arts. You don't have to go to India or Nepal to the man on the mountain to learn now. You don't have to go there. It's right there. But sometimes when it's right there, you don't appreciate it. Like for me, when I went to America um, the first time, I'd, I'd save my money up. I'd, I'd work for like nine, nine months on a building site. I was doing like, I did a couple of times that 18 hour shifts. I slept on the site and it was in the same clothes when I got up the next morning and started doing another 18 hour shift and then went home, you know, and really worked for it, really worked to get there. Then when I got there, um, I felt so inadequate because technically I didn't have anything like they had in LA because they were getting it every week, you know, it's like four times a week, sometimes from Guru Dan or Richard Bastille. So I was really feeling like inadequate, but then I realized I just need to get the information. I'm going to work hard on this, but I need to get the information. But I had to wait one year until I went back. And I've told this story before. I remember going back in, in, in 85 and um, and I was doing it from the year before. I was doing a technique totally wrong. I remember the drill wrong and I practiced it for a year wrong. And I went back to my hotel room, I was in tears because I thought I'm really trying to get this because the guy corrected that within 30 seconds. And I was, because I thought my heart's in the right place. I, my, I want to go the right way, but I don't have anybody to, to hold my hand day to day, if you like, you know. Um, so the difference there was that at least I, I persevered. So it taught me perseverance. It taught me that, you know, if I keep going, I will be able to get to that, that the, the level of these guys in LA, that I will be able to get the technicalities of this. Um, and uh, But I just need to really perse uh, persevere on it. And I think nowadays there's much more available. It's much more easily available. But for some people, particularly beginners, I don't think it's that great a thing sometimes. I think they need to know that you need to kind of focus on certain basic fundamentals, get those fundamentals, and then start to work out with that. And then as Hickson Gracie said to me when I interviewed Hickson, and he said, we all learn the same jiu-jitsu. But he was talking about his brothers actually. He said, we all learn the same jiu-jitsu, but then we begin, began to define our personalities. That means Hickson's jiu-jitsu is different from Elio's, which is different from Borean's, which is different from Hoyce. As much as they'll say, this is, ex this is the pure jiu-jitsu. Everybody puts their own slant on it. But the idea was that uh, what Hickson was saying is that we need to learn the fundamentals. We need to learn the basics, learn 
a core and have a core understanding of the art you're practicing and then start to kind of play play around with it a little bit more um but again I, again i think for me even uh, obviously i'm older now you know so i i i i um, I, I feel privileged to have been in the position i was in um and I think it's great for the, the kids that are coming up now, for the, the students that are coming up now to have that information. But, you know, there's caveats with everything. The internet's a great thing, but if you're on it 12 hours a day, it's not so good. You know, it's, you have to be able to just kind of go, okay, I need to use this and not let it use me. And I think that's the same in martial arts right now. Keep doing your training, keep doing it, but try and get an instructor that, you, that, that can help you in, in each area that will be honest with you and help you and then trust them. And I think that's a huge thing as well, that trust between a, a teacher and a, and a student. You know, I've told my students, I say, if you don't trust me, just leave. If you don't think that I'm giving you the best that I can give you. And I, I don't even mean that it's right because I, I mean, I've made a hundred mistakes and I will make many more mistakes, but, but I'm trying to get you from this place to that place and the best way that I know possible. And if you don't trust me on that, then pretty much we're done. Go and see somebody else, you know, because not in a bad way, just that, you know, it requires that, I think, you know, and again, I've been very privileged and a lot of the, the instructors that I have, like Dan Inesano, um, amazing man, just an amazing, just blows my head off how great he is. Eric Paulson, Mauricio Gomez, you know, the people who have taught me, my boxing trainers, Toddy, who I met again in Thailand a couple of years ago. Eh? So really good, good you know for me good people that i can I, that i can learn from you know i don't know if that answers your question but uh yeah, I, I, I feel. I mean, honestly, it does. I mean, the, I think what one of the things that I mean, you touched upon it as well was, um, I guess one of the things that I was kind of getting at was before the internet and before where we are now, there was, um, like you said, people went into things deeper because there wasn't that choice, there wasn't that availability. Um, whereas nowadays, be, because it's so available and because of the media and and the promotion of uh, you know promotions like UFC. Um, MMA has become this coined term for everything, whereas obviously many years ago, before that was around, it was very much about, you know, people broke it down into individual styles, didn't they? Like, and they still do, but it was talked about as in, you know, this style of karate, this style of kung fu. Whereas nowadays, if you spoke to every person, they talk very generically, uh, and it's you know a lot of things get put in that bag of mixed martial arts, and and that. You know, it's it's a curious thing. You know, as as society's moved on, um, but like I so said, you've just you've just kind of touched on it. Then, um, how do you see uh, having trained in so many different styles? And how do you how do you co compartmentalize them? Then do you, you go, this is great for this, this is great for that. Um, how do you how do you view them then? What because obviously, like listen to different styles of music, isn't it? Maybe there's a one for one purpose, one for another, or do you see them all crossing over in between each other? I think there's a lot. I think there's some crossover, you know, between certain arts. But if you took like Lacan and the French savat, right? Lacan, the 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 art, the the weapons art. The, then if you took Lacan and tried to relate that to wrestling, it's going to be pretty. It's pretty a pretty hard match because. They're two totally different things. They're both martial arts, but they're so, so far, you know, um, away from each other. If you took Lacan and related to fencing and then related to Cali weaponry, then you would have a match that was kind of going in smaller increments that would be actually matching each other. I think the, the thing about, as you said, about way back when you were really learning everything individually, um, I think it's a good thing, as you said, where you're getting more depth in it. And also you're going to someone who understands that subject, who really <clears throat> understands that subject. And then you go, but why do you do that? Why do you do this? What's the reason for that? And if they're good, they'll have an answer for that within the confines of that system. So it's always good to go in there, you know, if you've got a good boxing trainer, you know, so you've got someone who's, who's, who's really just done boxing. It's good to have that. And um, because you're the one that has to fit around the other stuff but if you have a good boxing trainer, he's teaching you from he or she, or teach because the women boxing trainers too. That he or she are teaching you from the viewpoint of boxing, and you go, well, that's great, that that that's fantastic, and they'll give you the ins and outs of that. Then you can take what you need, or you know, 
or discard what you don't need and then go to the next thing and then try and segue that in so I think the same with the the, the judo and the jujitsu you know the judo is for me uh, wonderful you know I trained judo for a long time with some really elite players some very I mean I was never elite at judo anything like it uh, but 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 uh, I, I, I really enjoyed the judo just being there and having world-class people grip you and I've, I've told this story before I remember I'd go up there and I'm doing gripping and you got when you have it's like a Muay Thai clinch right if you've got a, a, a guy who's world-class gripping you then or, or clinching you it's a totally different feel it might look the same in a fall but it feels different so you learn through osmosis and for me the judo players were really great for that because I've been getting gripped by Billy Kuzak or Mark Preston or Graham Randall whoever and these guys uh, were just amazing grippers and then I worked at a nightclub and I remember I'd been training at judo that night and we were doing a lot of gripping and somebody tried to grab me at the nightclub and it was like they were going in slow motion it was like they were going like this and I, and, and I just kind of peeled off and wow you know and it, it, it demonstrated to me how like some people say but if they grip you then they can punch or whatever and I went but if you understand the game, you can keep that off and it doesn't even get to that. You're already there. You've not allowed them to even get a, 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 a touch on you, you know. Um, and with, with that, I think it's great to work within that. And then uh, one time, uh, Graham Randall said to me, we were doing some gripping. He goes, what's the other stuff you do? Like the trapping, you know, the movement on the trapping and stuff. I said, okay. I said, well, you try and grip me. So I poked him in the eye. And he's like, oh, that's really strange. But I didn't want to go to, I didn't mean to poke him in the eye actually, I just kind of came forward, but he said, that's really different. I said, yeah, but I want to learn from you what you do the best. It's, there's no point in me doing that. I'll add that later on when I'm doing my own thing. So you work, uh, you compartmentalize, you work individually. So you, you work, uh, you isolate and then you integrate. So you isolate the system, then you integrate it. I don't think you have to do it with everything, but for me, that was the way that I, I did it. I isolated this system. So I took judo for what it was, which I think is a fantastic art. I mean, amazing art for throwing. And, I, and, and we're talking about effectiveness. I mean, I saw Sean throw grown men when he was like 15 and, and knock them out on, 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 the, on the pavement, you know? And again, I'm not saying morally it's a good thing or not, but um, I saw the effectiveness right away. So I've no doubt how effective judo is, but I also know that there's some weaknesses within it if you look at it as a as a total art you know so then you go so i look at it individually um isolate it and then integrate it into what i'm doing and see if it fits into what i'm doing the same for the jiu-jitsu um, the jiu-jitsu there are certain things that of course you wouldn't do you don't want to mount somebody in the middle of the you know princess street in edinburgh if i'm having a fight i don't want to mount somebody because his pals are going to be kicking me in the head or hitting me with bricks or doing whatever or, or, or getting weapons out so but the mount's a great thing for teaching control if it's one-on-one -on -one, it's fantastic if you're just controlling your drunk uncle or controlling some somebody's got a bit crazy then it's fantastic so i think you have to isolate integrate but in order to integrate it's good to know i don't think it's totally necessary but it's good to know the ins and outs of your system so if you took something like and Wing Chun, you know, and I've not really done Wing Chun seriously for a long time, but but in Wing Chun you've got uh, Si Lam Dao, you know, um, which is, uh, uh, you know, the first form in Wing Chun, you know, which is just basically a horse stance, and then you're going through your your, 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 your tons, and you're going through all this stuff. So, uh, uh, and and the seed, that, that basically gives you, the, not the whole of Wing Chun, but it gives you a seed that you can understand the system from, if you really want to do that. Is it necessary to learn that to, to enable you to fight? No, I don't think so. But if you're a martial artist, then you probably want to go into that a little bit more. For anybody that's interested in trapping, um, I, I say to them, learn Silam Dao. Learn that because that's going to teach you about center line, occupying center line, dissolving center line. There's so many things within that. But again, if somebody said to me, I'm going to get a fight next week, two guys are going to come to my door, that's not what I would teach them. So um, you kind of have to prioritize and just say, well, what do I need? What do I need most at this time? So if you're fighting in the UFC, you're not going to be doing a sea limb down. You know what I mean? You're not going to be doing some heaven sex or anything. Usually, usually, I mean, some, some people you know, might do that, but 
but usually you're going to be focused on what you need in the cage or if you're you know you're fighting Thai or if you're doing a jiu-jitsu tournament when I do when, when, when I uh, do jiu-jitsu tournaments of course for six or seven weeks I'm focused on jiu-jitsu you know I want to make sure that I'm, I'm work, working on points I'm working on when I'm rolling not allowing anybody to score a point on me whereas normally I would just roll over and let them pin me and do whatever but I'm not going to allow that to happen so you just have to kind of have a goal and then just kind of prioritize what's most important within that goal and as we we're saying I think with so much information now people don't really understand what to do they kind of go off here and go off here um, and I think if you want to get serious about it um, you really need to have your goal and understand what your goal is if it's to be a functional all-round martial artist then you have to put in a lot of time you have to put in a lot of effort you know, you were saying you went to Amsterdam when you were, like, you were 17 or something, right? So, so I mean, you, you, you doing that is amazing, you know, because you have a vision. You go, I want to go there, and that can take you to other other places as well. But I think when people want to be want to be good mixed martial artists, they might underestimate how hard it can actually be to get. I'm talking to a good level, to a really good level of 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 martial arts. For me, I've always wanted to get to black belt level in every art that I practice. So I mean, good black belt level, not 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 like black belt where they just give you, but an actually a good black belt level, um, in that art. And then I realised that then it's maintenance, and that's again that like you were Dan said, it's it's not easy, but it's easier to get there than it is to stay there. To stay there, you got to put in so much stuff. I mean, it's like crazy, yeah. Especially as you as as you get older. But anyway, I, again, I don't know if that I kind of rambled on there, but hopefully that. Uh, Oh no no it's, it's it's perfect. I mean it, it, I mean again your background is so expansive. You're one of the few people that I can really kind of go you know you've got that experience across the high level of all these different things and you've you've been around so many different amazing people and we all stand on the shoulders of giants in in martial arts. Um so where where and again one of the things that I see in in modern kind of martial arts in terms of the internet and you know in certain communities is a bit of and again it's it's not something new but it's a bit of looking down on different art forms you know oh, that's got no relevance that's this and a lot of that is around that sport versus self-defense sort of situation you kind of touched upon it there um where where do you uh where do you stand on okay the the sport versus self-defense because obviously some some people are just training in, in combat sports We'll, we'll look down on the self-defense applications and and vice versa. So where do, where do you stand on on that crossover? I mean, you kind of touched upon it then, but how, how do you see, the, is the one style that covers all the bases or is it has to be, like, like you said from the beginning, cross-training uh, across different ones? Again, I, I think it's, it's, it's two things. One is you've got to decide what you want out of martial arts, you know, and what's good for you. I like like if you're there's two things one is if you're an individual i got to say like for me my my uh training in martial arts now is for a different reason than not is is for more reasons now than it was when i was a 13 year old kid just looking to be the best street fighter in the world so for me now i do it for health i want to be healthy i want to be in shape i want to be um uh able to teach you know, my students, you know, and try and pass on the information that I have to them in the best way that I can. If I'm a cripple or if I'm injured all the time, I can't do that. You know, I can't, I, I can't do that. So um, I think you have to look at each and then, and then the other thing is you have to look at each system and say, what does this give to me? And I, I had a guy come in one time and he did um, Wushu for eight years, I think it was. And when he trained with me, he wanted more of the self-defense stuff. And he said to me, it was really interesting because he said to me, because I've wasted eight years doing wushu. I went, no, no, you've not wasted eight years. I said, you've done a great art. I can't do the first movement in wushu. First movement, you can push your hands up. This girl tells you one thing. She goes, but you can't do it because you can't get your wrist back to 90 degrees. She goes, so, you, and I was like, there, my first lesson in wushu, I was thrown out. And, and, and I said to him, no, I said, you took a great art that is great for athleticism, for movement, spatial awareness, being dynamic, flexibility. So it's got lots of really great things, but what you really are looking for is a headbutt and a straight blast. That's what you're looking for. 
you know, but you never wasted your time there. You got a lot from it, but what you're wanting now is different from what that's going to give you. Is and, and there's no point in me criticizing any system and going, oh, that doesn't give you that or that, because it might not be saying that it's got that. Now, if the the the, the problem is when people say, I'm doing this system and my system, it's like in jujitsu. A lot of people say, um, well, I've, not a lot, but I've heard people say that they, you know, oh yeah, but jujitsu isn't street fighting, and jujitsu is not comp not not actually sport jujitsu at least isn't saying hey we're street fighting, but but sport jujitsu, forget the self defense part which is important too, but sport jujitsu when you and you know this Stuart, when when you got somebody choking you out, and you're in the middle of a tournament. And you're you're and, and you're up against that and you're choking. And I've been in that position. And then you have to work your way out. Look at the clock. There's 45 seconds to go. It's a world championship. And I got to reverse this guy, get on top and arm lock him in that time, or else I'm out. You know, that's pressure. You know, that's where you're dealing with pressure. So it might not be a street fight, but you certainly learn how to deal with physical pressure, emotional pressure, mental stress, you know, the stress of training for a tournament. And um, people go, oh, it's, well, tournaments aren't street fighting. I know that, but street the for two months or maybe three months, you're thinking, as soon as you put your name down for that tournament, you're focused on that from the moment you do that, whether it was in June and you're fighting in August or January, you're fighting in March, whatever it is, you're then tuned in. And you have a slow, slow secretion of adrenaline going through you all the time. And then you have to get on there and then perform. You know, and it's, um, I mean, I, I fought in the, the I competed in the uh, the, uh, the Europeans last year and in and, and my category, you know, the Masters. Um, I was so nervous. I was so nervous for it. Even now, I was like super nervous because, because I like, I had my students watching. It's live. It's on Flow Grappling. So I know my students are watching. Eric Paulson called me, told me that he was going to be watching it. Mauricio Gomez, my instructor, is watching it. My girlfriend's watching. My fiance is watching it. You know, so my kids are going to be watching it, and I'm feeling so much stress. I mean, I was in my my uh, I was in my hotel room doing shoots, squats. I was moving around my hotel room for two hours a night before I couldn't sleep. You know, I was like 17 pounds underweight. You know, I was so far under the weight, I'd just gone totally all off, um, and I, I won it. But the fight, the fight wasn't when I stepped on the mat. The fight was well before then. And what the, the sport thing can teach you is can teach you to discipline yourself, to be ready for that battle. So when the battle does come, you know, as I say, somebody trying to grab me as opposed to an Olympic judo player, ain't going to do, it's highly unlikely it's, not, it's going to do anything to me because I've already dealt with a world-class player doing that. And when people start to berate other people for what they train in, I go, you know, maybe you're misunderstanding things here. If you want to do... Um, it's like we could go to the Muay Thai clinch and go, okay, Muay Thai clinch, uh, if you bring knives into it, it's not the greatest thing. Because if you're clinching here, you're going to get stabbed. But that doesn't mean you shouldn't do Muay Thai clinch. It means you do Muay Thai clinch with an understanding the weapon might get pulled. So you'll be going under the body and checking the hand. So it's a different it's a different thing. But I don't like when people start to put stuff down because I think, you know, it might not be for you, but it might be for somebody else. And uh, like Tai Chi might not be for like some 20 year old kid that wants to fight in the UFC but maybe down the line if you want to be a martial artist and uh, then that's going to be more uh, appropriate for you and just to finish on that the, the only thing is when people start to make kind of more false claims saying we'll beat anybody in the world and I say Tai Chi there was somebody had this thing up they did there was a system that one form and they said if you learn this one form in three years nobody will be able to beat you and I went, this is just, they should be taking it to Trace Description Act. It's just ridiculous what they're telling. And they had people in the class. And I was going, man, this is absolutely, it's dangerous, you know, because you're making claims for this thing. They're so untrue. It's unbelievable. And I think, you know, that it's okay for anybody to do a certain system. And if they like that system, that's great. But try and see it for what it is. Try and have a good understanding of what it is. And if the person like that are making false claims for it, that's a problem. But if somebody wants to train in karate or want to train in um, kung fu or do hangar or want to do tai chi, man, good on them. You know, I think that's great. As long as you have an understanding of what that's actually going to give you. And if you don't, then you really got to kind of look into it and, and have somebody try and 
like that guy that did uh, uh, Wushu, you, you ha he really needed somebody to direct him to where he actually wanted to go. But he never wasted eight years. It just needs, so Wushu is a great art. It's a beautiful, I wish I could do it. I can't do it. I wish I could do it. But it's a great art. But he was just going to a great art that wasn't really fulfilling his needs. So when he got with what we were doing, that was more appropriate to what to what he wanted. Yeah, I mean, funny you mentioned Wushu. I'm, I'm actually uh, going filming with uh, some high-level Wushu guys for the first time uh, after this this lockdown, and I'm kind of looking forward to that. It's not, it's it's it's, a, it's again, it's an art form I've never trained or or been involved with. Yeah. So I'm kind of I'm really looking forward to seeing it done at high level. And I've seen the guys training in it, and it looks super impressive, super athletic. Um, and and like what you just mentioned there, I'm o I'm always crossing different martial arts and communities, and I'm always um, promoting the positives and I'm like like what you just mentioned there I never like to uh, be negative um, and the one thing you mentioned there was about finding the right person and and I, and I guess this is what what's, what's going to lead me into my next question is you know you, you know I'd count yourself as this kind of an individual but what what have you gained from um, from all these exceptional individuals that you've been around what what makes someone uh, a great martial artist and a great martial artist instructor. So, you know, Dan Inosanto compared to, let's say, you know, uh, someone teaching karate one lesson a week in the local gymnasium, it's it's going to be worlds apart, but they're on the same path to some extent. Yes. You know, they, they want they want to be better than what they are today. But what what separates uh, these exceptionalist individuals, like you've mentioned, uh, Michelle Gomez and um, Paul Vunak and Eric Paulson and all the other individuals that you've been around, what what do you think is is something that is quite common between them? I think that they, they love what they do and they care about sharing it. You know, they want to share it. So, you know, sometimes, you know, I've been around people who, you know, okay, if you pay me, it's not, not so much now, I'm talking about back in the day, if you pay me X amount, then I'll show you eight techniques. And then if you pay me another X amount, I'll show you eight, eight techniques. And, it's obviously a money, a money um, uh, kind of maker for them, which is fine. I have no problem paying for lessons. That's not a problem. Um, I, I find that the people we have been fortunate, and I, I feel being blessed. You know, I'm a Christian. I feel like God's blessed me. So many people in my life that I think that with uh, um, Guru Dan's kind of an extreme example because he's. On a, from my, my view, a totally different, a different level than most martial artists. But um, let's take someone like uh, Mauricio Gomez in Jiu Jitsu. Mauricio, I met Mauricio 23 years ago, I think, 22 or 23 years ago. And uh, from the beginning, we clicked because he's super honest, doesn't pretend to be that what he is, and is just superb at Jiu Jitsu. His understanding of Jiu Jitsu is just like off the chart. And um, he's. Um, um, how can I put it? You know, he's he's authentic. He's very authentic, man. You know, what you see is what you get. So if I ask him about something, he'll go, "Yeah, it's because of this," or he'll go, "Let me think about that." He doesn't BS. He doesn't kind of do that. He's very and he wants you to get better. I mean, he's been there with me through tournaments and uh, in Brazil. You know, training me for the week. Being there with me, being making eye contact, I'm on the mat, and boom, he's shouting stuff out, and, and he's really, really helped me and really cared for me, and has gone beyond, you know, handing X amount of money for this or going uh, uh, for that. He's an amazing, amazing man. Eric Paulson is another example of that. Eric is uh, super nice, um, so, super talented. I mean, Eric's like, Eric is like a, a, a genius, and I, I don't use that word lightly. And martial arts has so much stuff it's incredible um but he's a super compassionate uh person who um um again because I, I was training with eric at first and then eric became my instructor um but at one point i was in la and I, i'd been i'd been on the road for seven seven weeks and we're talking and i didn't have a credit card i had no money i was in larry hartzell's apartment in la and I was going to have to walk to the airport the next morning because, and I hadn't eaten for a day, maybe two days I hadn't eaten for, because I didn't have any money to, to, to eat, right? So Eric comes up and sees me to say goodbye. So I'm talking, he says, what are you doing tomorrow? And he, he hardly had anything because he was working as a bartender. And uh, 
and I said, uh, you know, I'm going to have a bit of prom. I said, how far, how do I get to LAX? It's about a three mile walk through LA, you know, and it's, and it's nuts, you know, and, uh, and I knew he had hardly any money. And then uh, when he left, I don't know, I, I picked something up and it was $10 underneath my jumper uh, where he had left it. And that, that's the kind of thing that shows he really cared for me. It wasn't just about get me for a seminar, do this, do that. He gave from nothing, you know. So for me and Eric, that was that, that was like one of the defining moments where it really bound me to him. And uh, he was such an amazing person. Apart from being an amazing martial artist, a really caring, caring person. He, he actually does care about people, isn't isn't just faking it. Um, Larry Hartzell was the same. Larry's a beautiful person. I loved I love C.F. Hartzell uh, a lot. Um, and, you know, a lot of the people, like Mark Preston, my judo instructor, he, I was out uh, with him uh, two days ago, we were talking about some stuff. And Mark's the same. Mark's like a, a really caring person, uh, really cared about. I went to him for private lessons at first, but he was just super caring and really wanted to give it. He would go to my judo grade and watch me um, uh, and, uh, you know, help me, help me with stuff technically, you know. So I've been really fortunate in that, but I would say the fact that they actually care about you getting better and they want you to get better and um, we're on the same page in terms of what, how we view humanity. You know, it might not be on the same page even for religion or anything like that, but we're on the same page about how we view things. And Dan in the Santa was like that too. You know, Dan, Guru Dan is like, a, um, it's just such a, a great example of a human being. You know, he's such a, uh, such a beautiful person, uh, a really caring person. And he's always been super nice to me. I mean, he's just like, incredibly nice, incredibly given if I have a question, he's given me private lessons for free, um, done so much stuff for me and, and, and done it for no other reason and he wants me to get better, you know, and be, be a better human being, you know, and he's great. And now I can go to LA and as I said before, I used to go for like six, seven weeks, but now I can go to LA for six days, I can have breakfast and dinner with Dan and Asano and that's enough for me. I can leave after that because just speaking to him is... I get so much from just sitting talking with them um, and just having dinner with them, just me and him. And it's such a privilege to be able to do that, you know. Um, obviously, because of COVID, I haven't seen him for a while, but uh, it's such a privilege to, to be in that position. And he's an amazing, amazing man who you just want to aspire to, you know. And I want to be, I want to be like, you know, never will be. And, and I could never be the martial artist that Dan Inosan was because he is full on all the time i need a break i need to go and watch justice league or something you know i need to go and watch a movie or you know and and so does he but but he's full on all the time and that's why it's got so good and for me i go i i don't want to pay that price for for what what he's got but i am you know i'm, I'm quite um happy doing what i'm doing and being um and with the rewards that i've had uh rewarded richly that I, that I have that. So these guys have given me, these instructors have given me so much more than just techniques. You know, they've really helped me try and be a better person, try and be, have a, 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 good, a good moral compass, try and do the right thing. And that's really what, what they've guided me toward. There's been other people, and obviously I'm not going to name names, we have met who um, are superb martial artists, but I don't really think too much of them as people, if I'm being honest. We, even though they could teach me till the cows come home, I really don't want to deal with them. You know, I don't even want to be in the same room as them, to be honest. You know, and I just, I just, I just don't want anything to do with you. It doesn't matter if you teach, teach me a million things. I just don't even want to be in the same room as you. But I'm very privileged to really have got teaching me, and we, we um, are my instructors, and we mentor me and help me, and uh, you know, do so much more. Yeah, I mean, like you said, there's that common, you know, you just mentioned there, that, that common approach about caring about other people. Um, and I guess, you know, that that's where it, it, it kind of comes about. When when people in martial arts uh, hit these high levels and, and stay in the game, they kind of go from what they get out of martial arts themselves and then it turns into what they can give out to others. And that's that journey, yeah. isn't it? Is you know you take you take a lot from martial arts, and then eventually you, you know you see that actually to be the best version of yourself, it's about helping others and then you know giving giving back to the to the community in, in whatever way you can. 
So in, in, in the Filipino martial arts, they, they, they describe things by, a lot of things by triangles and three, you know. And one of the, the, the highest level triangles they have is they say love, compassion, and humility. So everything you do is done out of love. Even if you fight, so if we have, if I have a fight with someone, um, I might be fighting to protect my, my children or my fiance or my or some somebody. So I don't fight because I hate that person. I fight because I love the person I'm protecting, or I love if I'm protecting myself, I love life myself. You know, so I might do some serious damage on someone, but it's not because I hate them, it's because I, I love life or I love you know the person that I'm with. So everything really should be should be, I'm not saying I always do this by the way, I'm an angel, but everything should be done out of love, you know, and that's really important. And so they have love at the top and, and on the left hand side of compassion. If you can do it with compassion, you know, because you know, like when you're teaching, I'm a very slow learner. I mean my 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 instructors have a really have, must have a really good thre patience threshold because it takes them so long to get th uh, things through to me sometimes. And I am, um, I, 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 but you have to have compassion for people because you'll find people that can, they pick up fast, some people can. But when you're explaining something to somebody, don't treat them like an, they're an idiot. I have one guy who in the early days treated me like I was a, an idiot. I mean, really, and was so off the chart terrible. And, uh, and he's a name and I went, now the, the tables have kind of turned a little bit. He's contacting me to, to do stuff and I've just blanked him because I'm going, how you treated me? It's that old saying, you know, you can judge somebody by how they treat a waiter in the restaurant. If they're treating you nice, but they treat the waiter bad, that's generally, they only want something from you. So for me and, and, and from the Cali perspective, you should treat everybody with compassion because it's important that you understand that everybody was a beginner if somebody can't get a technique, I always try and remember when I couldn't get that technique or didn't understand a concept, then I'll try and explain to them that's it. Or if they're tired and they can't get through it, I know that, you know, when I went to base camp Everest, I was dead when I got got to the the, the end part and I remember how I felt when I was really at, at, at the end. So you have to have compassion with people and that's really important. Um, and then the, the other part is humility, being humble, because there's number one uh, for me i believe that god gives you all the talent you have i believe that or gives you the the the, the opportunity to get that talent and your talent can go in a day a, you could walk out and get hit by a car you could get stricken you can have a, 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 a you know get some disease so it can go quite quite easily um but i'm very thankful for what i have you know i'm very thankful and if you win a championship like uh, Yasuhiro Yamashita said, you're only a champion for one minute, one hour, one day max. The next day, everything could change. I know there's tournaments I've won that I thought, man, if this was like in an hour's time, I would probably lose this tournament, you know. And there's some that I've got a silver that I thought, man, if it was tomorrow, I could win. But you staying humble, I think, is understanding that there's always somebody better than you. That it's a gift. What we have is a gift. Um, one of my heroes died yesterday, uh, Toshihiko Koga. He's a judo, judo player. Um, one of my absolute heroes, only 53. And uh, he, he's amazing. What, what, one of the best players ever. Um, and, um, you know, and what he had and what he gave me, I never met him, was like a gift, you know, to me. And I'm very, uh, you know, thankful for that. And he was a really extremely humble guy. So I think, I think it's important to stay, you know, to do everything with love, to have compassion, and then to stay humble as well. And when I say humble, I don't mean like you have to have your head down, not being proud of your achievements. Like you should be proud of what if you get a black belt or if you get a blue belt or if you get a whatever belt, it doesn't matter. Then be proud of what you've done because you've worked that hard to get that. You know, if it's a kid, he's got the, got the gray belt or whatever. Be proud of that. Just don't get stuck there. You know, be proud of it and then move on to the next challenge, you know, and then keep going. And I think that's a really important thing. Um, um, right there and then uh, for the, the humility again just just saying that uh, you know that everything you've done well for me in a way can be taken away in a heartbeat you know but I'm very I'm very thankful for what I've been given the opportunity for and I think that's, that, that those things are really important whenever I see somebody kind of walking around like giving it all this and I'm a tough guy I go man I've seen a million tough guys 
I just I don't need to see another tough guy. It's not that big a deal to me, you know. So, um, but I think from a Cali perspective, that kind of lines up a lot with what those instructors that I was talking about. They all have that that kind of mentality. None of them. You would never think they were tough guys. They don't look like tough guys most of them, but they they can certainly switch it on when they need to. But they're also very compassionate and uh, very humble people too. So. Now that you've achieved so much and, and and done and done so much in terms of martial arts so far, where where what what does the future hold? Have you got any uh, goals or you know what 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 are your plans for going forward? Then ha- having obviously one of the things that you can see through all your time is that you've constantly wanting to develop, wanting to be better. Like you said right at the start, you said that was your goal. You wanted to be better. What what what's next then? Um, I, I, I just want to, con, con, well, what I try and do is set a goal every year that I'm going to do something, okay? So, let's say last, uh, like 2018, uh, um, I want to win the Gee Worlds in, in America, you know, in Las Vegas. I mean, Masters, my age group, right? But it's Black Belt uh, Jiu-Jitsu, okay? So, that was my aim that in 2018. I did that. Lucky, I was very lucky I did that. And in 2019, um, I got the opportunity to go to uh, base camp in Everest, you know, which is one of the hardest things I've ever done. I just wasn't really prepared for it, you know. So I went to base camp, and that was a challenge for me. So that was outside of martial arts, but also linked in because it brought me back mentally to where, you know, I thought, man, I should really be pushing it more, you know, and, 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 and pushing myself. And then in 20, the beginning of 20, I went to the European Jiu-Jitsu Championships, because I thought, well, I'm healthy. I should give it a shot. I did that. Um, got myself in shape for that. Did that, and then obviously COVID, uh, COVID came. Um, so now, um, it really depends, you know, because this year maybe going to do uh, go to maybe I'm not I'm not sure. I have to touch with fiance and stuff, but go to uh, Argentina and do a seven thousand meter mountain uh, there. Okay, so if the um thinking about competing again in jiu-jitsu um, and again what all that does really what, what it does is it can it keeps me sharp where well you know you know if you're competing you know you, you, your mentality switches right away as soon as you think about it your whole mentality switches from when you're rolling about in the club to you know to something else so I, I, I'm thinking about that would be my challenge for this year um, and I just want to be able to give the art to people you know and to, to give the art um, be, be the best teacher that I can be and a lot of times I'll watch stuff like instructionals and even if I know the technique then I'll just look at the way the person instructs it how they teach and I think oh man I should be able to point that out more or I'm learning how we teach you know because I've never been a natural teacher I've just kind of blundered my way through it you know um, and I just want to become a better teacher so that for my students whatever I have if I can help them, then I can do it in the best way, in the most efficient way possible. Uh, at the same time, you know, being in shape myself, keeping myself together, um, being mentally sharp, you know, and, 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 and so forth. But, but we'll see what happens. But that, that's a couple of the things would be the Argentinian thing uh, at the moment, and then um, potentially competing again this year. Because if COVID's taught us anything, it's like we should take our opportunities. You know, because we've been well, we are locked up now. We can't leave, can't leave the country. So, um, no, yeah, not totally nuts. But, um, but what we, but what we got to do is go. Let's take the opportunity now and go. And one of the first things I'll be doing is going to see Dan Inosanto in LA. As soon as it opens up, I'll be going to see him uh, because I really miss him. I haven't seen him in over a year, which is highly, which is the most I haven't seen him since 1984. So I just want to go and see him and pay my respects to him. Um, I mean, I spoke to him on the phone a couple of weeks ago, but it's, it's really important that I, I, I go and see him uh, and, and and just kind of catch up and just see what's going on. And I ask him the same thing. I ask him, I say, bro, what do you think I should do now? What do you think? I, uh, I said to him um, a while ago, uh, I said, what do you regret not doing? And I said, what do you think I should do? He said, keep your legs and your hips strong. He says, keep your leg, legs and your hips strong and he said, uh, and stay flexible. He says, because the first thing that goes in the horses is the legs. And as people get older, their legs start to go. So keep strong there, keep your core strong, and stay flexible. And he goes, it's going to make, give you an easier life. 
And I'm like, well, okay, that's great. You know, that's cool. So simple things like that, that I'll go to LA and he'll give me a couple of words and I'll go, okay, and that'll keep me going for six months. You know, so, um, but yeah, I have a few things that, that I want to do, but I just want to stay healthy. You know, be honest with you, I just want to be healthy, be able to, you know, get through this this whole this whole crazy time, um, be a better teacher, be the best martial artist I can be. I'm, I'm 58, uh, I'm 59 tomorrow, actually, but 58 right now, so I want to make sure that I'm, um, uh, as healthy as I can be for my age. You know, I can't be what I was when I was when I was twenty. I was running sub three hour marathons. You know, that's not going to happen again. Yeah. You know? So so, but that's fine. That's okay because that's just a different time. But what I can do now is work. You know, in a different way and and keep myself going. I don't think there's any excuse for just giving up. You know, Dan in the sun was eighty five this year. And he's training like a demon, like, you know, it's crazy, you know, it's amazing. It's absolutely off the chart amazing, yeah. So that's a couple of things that I've got lined up for, for this year. So um, just to, to, to finish that, for anyone listening or watching, um, and again, you know, this is the thing, people get inspired by people that they've sometimes never even met, just by, you know, like you've mentioned before, by someone that, you know, you might watch as an athlete or as a coach. So for someone listening or watching them what would be the kind of free free things that you could say as 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 advice from someone with your vast experiences to how they could improve whatever martial art they're doing over the over the coming year well i think you know have a vision of what you want to do is 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 one thing obviously um train hard and train safely and train intelligently, you know, so that's three things, but that, that, that would come in there. So you want to have a vision because you need to, I mean, if I'm going to go to Aberdeen from here and, and I start heading south, then I'll end up in Aberdeen, but it'll take me, like, I have to go around the world to get there, right? So I need to know where I'm going. I need to know the direction that I want to go and why I'm going to go there. And again, that gets back to, you know, if you want, if I want to be a good grappler, then probably, and nothing, Taekwondo, wouldn't be my first stop, you know, probably jujitsu, judo, wrestling, sambo, things like that would be my first stop. If I were to be a good kicker, probably taekwondo is where I'm going to, I'm going to go first. So I just kind of need to know where, where I'm going to go uh, and why I want to go there. That's, that's a really, uh, a really important thing. Okay. And the other thing is when you're training, you got to train smart. Just try and do things that will cut out time. So for me, for my cardio now, I do a lot of my cardio on the back. So I'll be doing a lot of bag work, um, and that's my cardio as well. Um, and steady because my uh, my my knee gets a little bit sore when I run. I used to run a lot. I can still run maybe five miles, but you know I can't do any extended extended runs. So but so I do a lot of cardio on the back. But then so then I'm getting my technique together. My technical base is still there. Um, it's still there and then and I'm getting my cardio so you're trying to train smart you know train hard train smart but train train uh yeah and train intelligently so that you you can really figure out and also when you train intelligently it means something's not to train sometimes like some of my guys in the gym and um, they come in and I've sent them home because they've trained already trained six days that week hard twice a day and then I go go home get a pizza on the way home, have a pizza or go and see a movie. Do you know what I mean? Don't train tonight because sometimes you need this discipline not to train and go, okay, I need to kind of let this go and have a rest day. So um, so you have to train smart. Uh, and the third thing is really enjoy it. Try and, try and get as much enjoyment. For me, I was far too serious. I never enjoyed it enough when, when I was, I enjoy, I enjoy martial arts more now than I ever have, and I've been doing it since 1975. So I don't know how many years that is now, 40, I don't know, 40 years or something, 46 years, something like that. So, but I actually enjoy it now more because I feel, I, I don't really feel that much pressure, you know, um, and I think, you know, that I, 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 uh, I think for anybody doing martial arts, you won't be doing it if you don't enjoy it. You need to enjoy it. And for my academy, um, that's what I, I say to people, I say to uh, anybody that comes in, you need to enjoy this. Otherwise, why would you on a Tuesday night after work? You want to go into something that you don't, you don't actually like. So that's really important. So, you know, I'd say have a vision, train smart, train intelligently, train hard, you know, um, uh, and train safely, of course. 
and then the other thing would be just enjoy it try and try and make it something that you really like and if you're in an academy where they're teaching an art that you like but you don't like the atmosphere I would get out and try and find somewhere else not that you don't like them that you don't like you know maybe the instructor is you know trying to encourage you give you a hard time or whatever in a good way but if you just find it's like a toxic environment and um, then I would say then you need time to move on. You need to move on. I've, I've known a few people that have gone through, uh, you know, um, club come from clubs with a really toxic environment. And I didn't really know it was out there until they told me. I was like, wow, you know, it's really bad. So you need to kind of get out of that because it's going to, it's going to really um, poison your mind in terms of martial arts and what martial arts is, you know, and how, um, you know, and how you're going to view that. And then it could put you off martial arts completely. And when it's got so much to give, it's something I think is beautiful that you could use and you can use to enhance enhance your life. Yeah, no, I couldn't I couldn't agree more. Um, well, I just want to say thank you for having spent this time uh, talking to me. I'm sure everyone who's been listening or watching has, has, has really enjoyed it. Now, for anyone who wants to find out any more information about um, your academy or even where, where you're doing seminars throughout the year once, obviously, once you're able to do so, um, where can they where can they go to find out more? Well, to be honest, I, I don't really do seminars now. Uh, I used to do a lot of seminars. One year I did fifty in, in, in one year, you know, and uh, I used to do a lot. But I made a decision. Um, I do do some seminars, but not not very many. But I, mean, I kind of made a decision. I want to spend more time at my academy, you know, so that I could teach there. And I can, as I was saying be a really good teacher for the people who are coming to my academy because as you know seminars take you take you take you away so much um, and um, uh, but if anybody wants to get in touch we're on Facebook that's probably the best way we have Rick Young's Black Belt Academy uh, Facebook page there's two someone set up a mixed martial art one and another one but that's not ours you'll see uh, this kind of regular I post there quite a lot um, but Rick Young's Black Belt Martial, art, uh, Martial Arts uh, Academy. Um, and if anybody wants to come in, or, or www.rick-young.co.uk. That's rick-young.co.uk. That's our website. We're just getting updated just now. Um, but if anybody wants to come and train in Edinburgh, you can train. If you're a visitor, you can train two weeks for free. Come in. You can take as many classes as you want. Have them for free. Um, you meet all the guys. We've got like 22, 23 classes a week. But we always let visitors train for free. So if we're coming along, you know, absolutely more than welcome. We've got normally we, uh, we've got loads of people coming in from out of the country because Edinburgh's a very popular, you know, place to come. And if anybody's coming through, you know, they'll come in and train with us. And usually, if it's somebody that's good, we'll get them to teach a class or teach a technique. You know, they can show something. You know, that maybe they've got. You know, um, so they can kind of contribute a little bit to the academy. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it. Yeah, and more, more they're welcome to get in touch, and we'll if they're coming to Edinburgh and help them out and make them feel welcome. Sounds amazing. I, I, I'm I'm gonna uh, be popping by next time. I I'm in Edinburgh. That's for sure. You're well. You're welcome. Yeah. Well, you see, we're all been up at Voitex, so you're you're more more than welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And thanks thanks so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. Thank you. No, thank you, Rick, and and thanks uh, to everyone uh, listening, and watching. I hope you enjoyed it, and uh, stay tuned uh, for the next episode. Thanks, guys. Okay.